Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome back. So, I wanted to answer a few questions I get about keeping a porcupine puffer uh, in, in reef tanks. And I think that's probably the, the, the most asked question is, are porcupine puffer fish actually safe for your reef tank? Are they going to be safe around your coral? And the answer to that is yes and no. And let me kind of explain why. Um, when you first get a porcupine puffer and it's a baby, they are not fully dependent upon just the food source coming from you. They're still going to have natural instincts to hunt, to chew on things, to help grind down the teeth. So, for example, there was, uh, there was a, a point where I, I was having trouble getting oysters on a half shell from my local fish store. And uh, I would run out of them for a week at a time here and there. And I would notice during those, during those weeks that some of my little stony, skeleton-based structured uh, corals would come up missing. And then I caught him with one in his mouth and he was chewing on it to help grind down those teeth. So porcupine puffer fish, they, they have these teeth that never stop really growing. They keep getting sharper, they keep growing, and they've got to chew on like shells and hard things, which is kind of why I have this mess of shells in here. Uh, I have to kind of sweep that out every so often. It builds up. This is obviously his, his feeding corner over here. Um, this is his spot. He got he, he likes his uh, little zinnia bed there. He hangs out there. He peeks at me. He plays peekaboo. He kind of pops around and looks with one eye. Uh, but anyway, uh, during those times is when I found it. And when I finally found him uh, chewing on the one piece, he chewed on it, smashed it into pieces, and it went all over the place. Uh, ended up, you know, getting blown up underneath the rocks, and I mean, it was just particles at that point. So there went that piece of coral too. Um, but that's really the only time he's ever done anything to my coral was during those periods where I didn't have oysters on a half shell or something with a really hard shell for him to chew up. Now I always make sure I'm stocked up on that stuff, and I always give him uh, at least one of them a day that he can chew on. And uh, I usually do that before feeding because he'll be hungry. So I'll give him that, that oyster on a half shell because he prefers some of the other food that I give him. So uh, I'll throw him the oyster on a half shell because I know he's hungry. He'll eat it first off. He chews up that shell. I know he got a little bit of grinding done on them teeth. And then I will give him uh, his other pieces of food. So I would say when you first get a small one, uh, if you throw it into a tank and start putting little pieces of coral in there, and you're also sticking your hand in there to feed him, He's not going to differentiate between the piece of coral that you put in there and the piece of shrimp that you fed him. So that's one thing. you gotta, uh, you, you got to train him for a little while. I had mine in a... Uh, when I first got him, he went into a displayed refugium that was attached to my system. So he was in with nothing but macro, calerpa, and stuff like that. So he, he had no coral really to chew on. And I had him in there for about a year, and that's... Um, how I got him fully hand, tra hand, hand uh, trained for hand feeding and, and, and all that. So he was completely used to looking to me to feed him from my hands. Uh, and I never had any uh, issues, like I said, in my reef tank when I finally moved him over to the reef tank until I, s I would run out of oysters on a half shell or some hard shelled food for him to chew on. So I, I guess that's my experience with the porcupine puffer is as long as they're kept fed, and not overfed, because that can be really unhealthy for them. Don't overfeed them. But if you keep them fed well with a good variety diet and make sure you're getting that piece of shell in there every day for him to grind on, he's less likely to pull off a, a small flat frag and chew up the frag along with the coral or the uh, frag plug. Because that's what he was chewing on was the frag plug that that coral was on when I caught him. So I would say... To answer that question is just, uh, you know, keep them away from any stony or hard coral for at least the first year and allow them to uh, get used to being fed by you and the food that you feed them and get those shell foods in there. Um, another question is, how big of a tank does he need to be in? A lot of people ask me, how big is the tank he's in now? He was supposed to be in a 220-gallon aquarium at the beginning of this year. He had outgrown the 120. I first bought him in a 40 gallon, he was in there, and then I moved up to a 55 gallon, turned it into a, a refugium, uh, like two months after I got him, and then um, from there we put him in a 90, and from the 90 he went into the 120, and I'm putting him in the 220, unfortunately COVID kind of slowed my progress, I've got a thousand square foot facility that I'm building right now to, to uh, start doing some reef farming, coral farming, and uh, Unfortunately, it got delayed because of COVID, so he's still in my 120 now. 
Uh, he will be going into a 220 hopefully at the beginning uh, of uh, next year, so uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. So I would advise at least minimum plan on having at least a 180 gallon aquarium, 220 gallon aquarium, somewhere around, around that range. I would plan for that um, in the future. You could start off small, but they're going to grow fast in the first year or two, and you're going to go from a 40 to a 90 in the first year, year and a half. Um, so there's no point in doing all those upgrades. I happen to have a lot of tanks laying around, so the, up, uh, the upgrades were not that big a deal. I just pulled out a new tank, set it up, poured the same water into the new tank. Um, I ran bare bottom tanks, so I didn't have to worry about all the sand kick up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but like I said, just uh, plan for a big tank because that's eventually what they're going to have to go uh, into is a big tank. They need room to swim. Uh, let's see, what are some other questions that uh, people ask me? I'm, I'm trying to think of this off the fly, guys, so... Uh, cut me some slack here. <clears throat> oh, what types of food do I feed mine? Uh, he gets cubes of uh, frozen uh, fish eggs. He gets cubes of mice shrimp. Um, I feed him chunks of shrimp out of bags of frozen. Uh, the frozen bags of shrimp you can get at the grocery store that have been peeled. They are raw. And the tail's been kind of torn off so there's no like shelling on it or nothing like that. And then I rinse them off real good before I feed them to him. He gets those uh, a few times a week. Uh, he gets the oysters on a half shell and any other type of meaty shell foods that you can find. Um, I buy a lot of tiny snails at a time and I drop them in and he goes down and he eats them all. So um, all these different types of things, just uh, I would say a variety diet would be best. That's what I, that's what I feed him. I started off and I made a mistake because I liked watching him feed when I first got him and I was getting ghost shrimp and that kind of steered him towards uh, inverts, you know, shrimp and things like that. Uh, I wouldn't do that. I got him off of that very quickly when he ate a couple of peppermint shrimp I threw in there to do some work, and uh, he swallowed them whole. So I veered him away from the ghost shrimp uh, because I have kept him with inverts. I've got a... Uh, he just happens to be out. I just looked over, and he happens to be out. But that's a uh, Harley Quinn shrimp, and I bought that for some uh, some of those tiny little white stars, Asteria, Astria stars, or whatever they are, little tiny uh, starfish to become a pest. Uh, I had bought that and thrown him in here, and he lived in, in there with Milo for about six months and maintained all those starfish until we uh, depleted the population of them. Um, but he's been in there with poor, um, with uh, peppermint shrimp. Um, I've had him in there with uh, coral banded shrimp, and he never bothered any of my shrimp, but he wasn't introduced to shrimp until he was about two years old outside of the initial ghost shrimp I was feeding him in the first few months I had him. So I would say don't do that. Stay away from live food, get him used to frozen, hand-fed food from you, and that'll give you a better chance of having uh, good survival with inverts if you decide to put them in the tank. Um, I don't have any inverts in this tank at the moment. Again, uh, this tank was supposed to be just uh, until this the beginning of this year when we got that reef facility up, but unfortunately, like I said, COVID kind of uh, set back the renovations, so uh, we're hoping to get that up in uh, 2021. Uh, let's see what some other things. Um, Tank mates, what can I, what have I kept him with and what can I keep him with? Uh, he's been in here with this Koran Angel and the Yellow Tang forever. They literally sleep next to him. They, um, they eat right next to him because they know whenever I feed him, he crushes everything and a lot of food particles come out of his, his uh, mouth. He'll spit it back out and all the fish will eat up all the particles that come down. So I actually don't actually feed the fish in this tank. I feed Milo and his aftermath of eating feeds the entire tank including feeding some of the uh, coral as well. So um, I really don't feed or, or target feed my other fish. Uh, the variety diet I give him feeds these guys as well. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, I probably wouldn't put him in with another porcupine puffer. There's a good chance they're not going to like each other. Um, I probably wouldn't put him in with um, any highly aggressive fish. And I wouldn't put fish that are smaller than his mouth wide open in there with him. Now you see I've got some chromies in here. I started off with six or seven but the first few didn't learn don't feed in front of his face because when he opens his mouth there's a suction that forms and it pulls everything in the water near his mouth into his mouth and he's accidentally sucked in a few fish and he bites down on them, realizes what he does and then he spits them out and then he goes over in his corner and he doesn't even finish eating because he feels awful. He doesn't mean to bite them. He didn't realize it because their uh, view right in front of their nose is a little difficult because of where their, their eyes are placed. 
Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, bigger fish, the better. Uh, nothing too highly aggressive, I wouldn't say, because the, he's never bothered any fish or coral or um, inverts or anything like that with uh, you know any ill intent. It's mainly been accidental or therapeutic being the coral that he was chewing on to help grind down those teeth. So I would say tank mates, uh, you got a lot of options. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to answer for this. I had a few people asking me questions. I wanted to make sure I touched on some of this stuff. Uh, let's see, let's see. Oh, uh, doesn't he pollute my tank with nitrites, nitrates, and ammonia and all that kind of stuff? Um, yes. My, my nutrient levels do run a little high, uh, usually anywhere between 5 and 15 parts per million. Uh, I do dose uh, no pox to help maintain that. I've got GFO, I've got um, carbon down there, I've got a skimmer down there. So I'm running a dual meaty reactor, so I've got all that hooked up. But uh, again, he's outgrown this system. He needs to be in a larger system with a larger filtration capacity to remove all those nutrients that he's placed in here. Up till this year, when it was time to move over and I couldn't move over due to COVID, up till then, he's always been fine in my tanks as far as like nutrient issues. Never had really any issues. Um, like I said, they run 5 to 15 parts per million. Nothing too crazy. Even my acros do good. I mean, this is a bonsai acro. does fine. I've got uh, WWC yellow tip uh, acros in here they don't you know there's another one I can't remember the name of that big acro there's another one back here um, like yeah so uh, I don't have a lot of acros in here right now but I did I sold a lot of them because again we're getting ready to set up the facility so the less coral that I have to transfer the better um, that way I can start off with a little fresher and, and a little more um, a little more ready for a facility versus just trying to transfer all these things over to a new tank and risking loss and stuff like that. So everything in this tank over here is pretty much for sale. I've got it all listed in uh, local Facebook groups. So um, you know they'll 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 come one by one. I usually sell one of these rocks of mushrooms for 70, 80 bucks at least once a week. I sell probably five of those mushrooms a week at twenty five dollars a pop. You know what I mean? So it's like a consistent little generation of money. Uh, but we're about to take this into the next level, and uh, we plan on taking you guys with us on this channel as well. I'm going to do all kinds of uh, uh, video series on each individual display tank that we set up in the new facility. Uh, all the building process, the plumbing process, the equipment cho choice, the, the connecting and hooking up of the tank, the cyclings of the tanks, the frag tanks, the sold tanks. I mean, everything. We're going to do a full, complete series on every little aspect of it. We're also going to film the building and the renovation of the inside of this facility. So uh, you guys get to watch that on the channel as well. So uh, hopefully I have a lot of new content coming in 2021. Uh, but until the next one, man, you guys know how it works. Thumbs up. Keeps it in rotation. And subscribe if you want to catch more. We'll see you on the next one.